SF Live, episode number 65. My name is Kai Hoffman of the CEO of the Sword Financial Group. Welcome. We're back from a brief break we took last week off, but now we're back in full swing. Episode 65 today. I'm joined in a few seconds by Ian Ball. He's the president and CEO of Abbott TV Royalties. And uh, we'll be chatting about the royalty business model and their activities right around Valdor and the ABTB Greenstone Belt. But before we do that, uh, be reminded to use hashtag AskRZZ, the company's ticker, for your questions during this live stream. We'll be getting to your questions, if you have any, at the end of our conversation with Ian. And also, please make sure to follow us here on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just hit the subscribe button. Turn on the alerts. That way you get notified on your phone or on your computer whenever we go live with a new update. That's it from my end. That's the housekeeping. Let me switch over to Mr. Ian Ball. Ian, how, how are you doing this morning or this afternoon for you? How, how are things? I'm doing excellent. How are you? No, not too bad. Not too bad. It's a new month. Uh, gold just broke $2,000 this morning on spot. Uh, I think everybody's happy. My pro for portfolio is looking great. I'm sure you're in a good mood as well. It, it, it certainly beats a, a few years ago. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's like 2018, 2019 was kind of rough. Like the summer of 2020 is not too bad. Give, give us a quick update. Um, ABTB Royalties is a company like you have five followers on Twitter. Uh, let's just assume it's not well known. OK, um, can you give us a 60, 60 second rundown uh, on, on the company? Sure. No, I'd be happy to. You know, when we looked at Abitibi, the whole idea was really to build what I believe was the, the best gold company. And that was taking bits and pieces from other gold companies that I admired, looking at American Barrick in the 80s, Gold Corp in the mid 90s to early 2000s. Franco Nevada for much of its history, and then also looking at things such as Brookshire Hathaway, who has a $300,000 share price, and you say, well, how can you combine these to create a um, gold company that is different in the eyes of its owner? So that's what we've tried to try to do here at Abitibi Royalties. Interesting. Okay, tell us a little more about the history of the company. I know you have a lot of assets around uh, the Abitibi region, in, in the Abitibi region, just uh, west of Valdor. Um, how did you acquire the assets, especially the royalties around the Canadian Malarctic Mine? Give us some more history on that. Well, you got to think back to you know, Malarctic. The Malarctic region has been around since 1935, and it mine was mining very successfully up until the 70s. Everyone sort of knows it in the current edition, which is Osisco Mining developing this large open pit. And they acquired those assets out of a bankruptcy. And the adjoining ground to the east uh, was, uh, was re reverted back to the province of Quebec, and they allowed people to go out and stake it. And there was a bit of a lottery where you put in your application to stake the land, and Abitibi's predecessor, who we were spun out of, Golden Valley Mines, was successful in staking the property uh, in 2006. And it then entered into a joint venture with Osisco Mining. And through that process, Abitibi, a Golden Valley, now Abitibi, uh, retained a 30% free carry interest in the land next to the Canadian Malarctic pit. You fast forward to 2014, and not a lot was happening. Then there was a bid by Gold Corp for Osisco, and then Yamana had made a subsequent bid, and all of a sudden there was this urgency to generate news, try to get a higher valuation on Osisco, and the first, what I would call, modern-day deep drill hole on the property intersected approximately four grams a ton, over 100 meters. And all of a sudden, that raised a lot of eyebrows. Um, so through different transactions, Abitibi ended up exchanging its 30% free carried interest for a 3% NSR over the entire ground east of the open pit. And now that mine is operated by Yamana Gold and Ignika Legal. And now uh, you have quite a few royalties in that area, obviously. Like how much cash are you generating from, that, from those royalties right now? And t tell us a bit more about your income stream and where, where is the income coming from? Yeah, so the income stream right now is fairly modest. Last year, we generated cash at just over $5 million. It was $5.3 million to be exact. This year, we, sh we should be on track to do better than that. And that is coming from uh, some smaller surface deposits at Canadian Malarctic, where we have a 3% uh, 
NSR, and it's also coming from an uh, investment income through uh, several investments that we have, both in Ignica Legal, Yamana, as well as uh, some non-core investments. So, so this year we're probably on track to generate uh, between the royalty and the investment income somewhere in the neighborhood of six to seven million dollars. Yeah, perfect. What was the production or the NSR production pipeline look like? Um, I know you. I actually don't know how many uh, NSRs you own, and uh, how many would come into production in 2021. And what's the? I wouldn't say guidance, but like, what's the outlook look, uh, looking like there for for the company? Well, this is really a story about a royalty on Canadian Malartic. We do have other royalties that we can touch upon, one of them which is making progress towards production. But when we look at Abitibi, when you look at it as an investment. It is all about the underground potential at Canadian Malartic. And the royalty income that we're generating now is very small in comparison to what we hope to be seeing when the underground commences production. Uh, so right now, it's, uh, our, our royalties cover a couple of hundred thousand ounces at surface, and, it, it, and it's also on about four and a half million ounces at depth. What we've seen is the operators announced about a week and a half ago that they're now starting to drive a ramp into the underground at Malartic. So that's really the first catalyst to unlocking the cash flow from the royalty portfolio. Interesting, interesting. Because uh, we we briefly chatted uh, before going live here, and you mentioned uh, like you recently bought a, a project that you got way more phone calls um, on that project acquisition, which only cost you seventy thousand dollars and a and a small NSR of 05 percent, if I'm not mistaken, um, than uh, your twenty six million dollar investment into Agnico. Is is the market craving? catalysts like new projects or new nsrs like what's the market looking for right now because the volume in the stock is fairly low if you look at it it's only ten thousand yeah. shares you mentioned over uh, overall exchanges um what, what, what's the market looking for right now it seems like with two thousand dollar gold your stock hasn't moved today for example like what, what's the market craving well, um, a couple of things. I think the market wants to get an, ex an update on the expiration results at Canadian Malartic. There's 10 drills operating at the mine. And the unlike a junior mining company, Yamana and Ignico don't provide as many updates. And so they're supposed to be coming up with an update at the, uh, the end of October with their Q3 results. Uh, because we are... Uh, thinly trade it. It doesn't take much for one seller or one buyer to either cap the share price or to see it rise or fall. So, you know, if you look at where we started in 2014, we were 35 cents a share. And now we're at $21. Um, you know, the recent performance doesn't concern me at all. When I look at Abitibi, you know, we, we are buying back our shares. I think we're the only company that I know that if you wanted to, you can buy the entire public float for the cash you have on the balance sheet. Um, so like you said, the, 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 the recent share price action doesn't concern me at all. Yeah. Now, you, one of the companies are probably the only company I know with 12 and a half million shares out uh, that, that is actually generating cash flows. And I think you even have that in your slide deck that you're the only company with a plus 100 million market cap with such few shares out like it's right. almost like a guinness book of world records kind of kind of number um like at one point you mentioned you were going to even reduce that to 10 million dollars like what's the strategy behind that it's like you're a royalty company and my understanding is royalty companies often use their shares as acquisition money to to add a new new royalty or something like what, what's the strategy what's the yeah. thinking behind that well i think the royalty of i think the discovery at malartic is going to make canadian history as one of the greatest discoveries ever in this country and when you have that, why would you want to dilute your owners? I, I look at it, when you issue stock, a lot of people say it's growth. Uh, we're growing, we're, we're, we're buying asset ABC, but what they don't tell you is that they're also selling part of their current royalty to strangers. If you issue 10, 20% of your stock, you're also selling 10, 20% of your current asset base. Why would I want to do that when I think I already have ownership of what I believe is one of the best royalties in the world? So growth, uh, people should change their headlines. You know, it should be, we have sold 20% of our company by diluting our shareholders would be a better headline for most of the news releases we see out there today.
Yeah, it's interesting. It's like you, 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 you sort of touch on that. Like, there's a lot of competition now in the royalty space. I think the yeah. last six months, I think I've, I've, I don't have a number, but it feels like we've seen a dozen new royalty companies pop up. Um, right. Like, well, what is that for you? Like, it doesn't look like you're out there looking for new royalties. Like, is that even like are are you competing even with them? Um, no. Um, you know, we're looking in different places. Um, we don't want to be where everyone else is. I think that's a losing proposition. You got to look at what is your competitive advantage. And we, we like to buy a private, not through public companies or other public vehicles. We like to be a first mover. We also like to provide funding for prospectors. I think prospector and prospecting is a great source of value within the industry. And, um, you know, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to expand our royalty holdings around Canadian Malartic, uh, both to the east and to the south and to the west. Uh, and we're quite happy doing that. You know, I think this is, like I said, I think this is one of the best royalties out there and I want to personally own more of it. So that's why we're reducing our share count. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, you, your name is very restricting, obviously. So Abbott TV Royalties doesn't really, like at least the name doesn't allow you to look anywhere else. Let's say Nevada, for example, right? Um, and, but I've noticed the map in your presentation as well that you're only looking, or it seems like you're only looking west of Valdor. Um, but the Greenstone Belt continues also to the east. Is there a certain reason why you're only looking to the to the west besides Malarctic maybe there? No, no particular reason. It's just the way, way the royalties have come about so far. Uh, when, we, when we started, it, when I joined the company in 2014, Malartic was all we had. And so that's why we tended to focus around that. But I also look at it, when you look at the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, when you look at the deposit sizes, they can be small, uh, maybe a million ounces, two million. When you look at Canadian Malartic and what it's produced historically, what it has in reserves and what it has in resources, you're probably trending somewhere between 20 to 30 million ounces. And that's very rare for the Abitibi. And that's why we're staying around Canadian Malartic. No, that makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a world-class asset. I've been to the mine a couple of times, at least to the visitors platform there. Um, it, it's quite impressive to see that. It's like uh, the, the trucks are like little ants down there. It's crazy. Um, what are you planning to do with the cash besides buying back some shares? Is there anything planned? I know you're paying a dividend, but it's, o it's only 0.7%. Um, nothing that would personally attract me, but are you targeting a different uh, investor group? Like are, are funds or generalists looking for that dividend to enter your stock? No, I, I don't. I don't think the dividend necessarily attracts new investors, but it does a couple of things. Uh, it pays rent to your shareholders while they they wait for the bigger cash flowing opportunity. Uh, two, it does impose a restriction on management that you can't just use all the money that you generate for your own purpose. I find that you can get very lax in your spending in terms of acquisitions when you have untold millions or uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars sloshing around your bank account. So when I was at Gold Corp um, in 2004, I remember Rob McEwen always saying, this is a good restriction on management that you, it's the shareholders who own the money, not the management team. So that's why we, we pay the dividend plus approximately 70% of our shareholders receive the dividend tax-free. So we thought it was just a, a good way of, of giving back. And uh, what will we do with the cash? Well, you know, we, obviously we're going to relook at the dividend. Um, you know, that's something that uh, is on, on the table, whether we should be increasing it. Two, you know, I am looking at or we are looking at other royalty opportunities, but it can't just be a simple here's a, a cash flowing royalty for sale, discount the cash flows back, and what is the price relative to NAB? Because I think that's a sucker's game. It's what insight do you have into the asset that your competition might, why is this deposit gonna double in size or why is it not? Uh, you know, what new things are being added? And I, I like to buy royalties where I've worked. And I feel that's what gives me particular insight. If you if there was a royalty for sale in Mongolia or Africa, I, I can't add any value there. But if it's the Abitibi, if it's Ray Lake, if it's Nevada, Mexico, uh, Argentina, places that I've worked extensively, I feel there's a value add there. And that's what I have to see is that you're paying one times NAV, 0.8 times NAV. But why do you think this is going to get materially larger? And now that you look at Franco, Nevada, it essentially grew off of one royalty at the gold strike mine. I think that's what people tend to forget. It was the growth of that asset 
And I also, I also say when you go to Toronto and you walk down University Avenue, you have the Monk Cardiac Center, you have the Rotman School of Business, you have the Lausanne School of Engineering, up the road you have the Schulich School of Business. All of those individuals made their fortunes from one single mine in Nevada being Gold Strike. So if you have a great asset, I think you, you really just should stick to it. Good point. Do, are we going to see the ball hospital wing soon? Um, no, I, I got to make some more money first before uh, we get to that point. But uh, no, no. I have, I have <laughs> donations, but on a, on a smaller on a smaller scale. <laughs> no, fair enough. I was joking there, of course. But uh, like one thing you're doing actually quite well, like in trying to work on and using leverage is, is actually investing all your salary, uh, your after tax salary into the company as well. So you, you right. took a, book, a page out of uh, Rob McEwen's book, although he only takes a dollar. At least you're investing everything back. Yeah, when, when, when I looked at uh, when I looked at Abitibi, people have to recognize when we when we, we buy back shares or we have a limited share account, you have to you can't just preach something. You have to practice it. And so Abitibi has not issued a stock option since 2014. Our outstanding share count equals to fully diluted. I think we're the only mining company in the world that can say that. Um, you know, after the last six years, I have invested all my after-tax salary and bonus back into the company. And you can look at the insider reports. I've never sold a share, and I think it's very important to walk into the same in the same shoes as your shareholders because when you get free options all the time and then you can reprice those options, I don't know how that's fair to the, to the investors. Uh, I, I think that as an industry, we can do a lot better job respecting the owners of these companies. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I want to wrap it up here about Abitibi because I want to talk about uh, the gold price and peak gold for a second with you as well. Um, just give us a quick, like sort of a put a bow around it for us, like catalyst for the next six months for, for Abitibi. Um, what do you expect in terms of exploration updates or so coming out of uh, Canadian Malarctic? Well, right now, as I mentioned, at the immediate mine site working on the underground potential, there's 10 drills operating. The operators just expanded the exploration program by approximately 20-25% for 2020. They will be coming out with an exploration update in the third, fourth uh, week of October. Regionally, if you go a little bit further to the east, we have a royalty in what is called the Midway Project, which is also owned by Canadian Malartic. And I, I think there's a mere opportunity at Midway as what we're seeing right now at the immediate underground there. And there has been drilling going on by the operators there. There was a historical resource. It had mined historically about 2 million ounces. So we're hoping to get an update perhaps there and then a subsequent resource update early in 2021. Uh, and in the meantime, we're gonna be seeing the ramp being driven into Canadian Malartic. Uh, the portal and the surface facilities are being constructed right now. And then subsequently, we'll see underground drilling, looking to define more of the resources, both at the Odyssey deposit and at East Malartic. I think there's a lot of growth that's going to surround those discoveries. Fantastic. All right. Appreciate that. Um, let, let's talk about gold and peak gold. And what, what, what does $2,000 mean for, for the overall environment? Um, I, I watched a Kitco interview you gave in, at PDOC, and you said uh, we haven't reached peak gold by any means yet. And I think that $2,000 gold price, this is my personal opinion, is actually driving that point home even better than anything else. Because one thing, like we've all been waiting for the massive M&A activity from the fallout of the mega mergers last year, early last year, and we haven't seen that. Right. Because at $2,000 gold, all those marginal assets are all of a sudden printing cash. Um, like, wh where do you see this headed? Like, give, give us uh, your opinion on that. Well, and I know there's a theory in the gold industry that we're going to run out of gold. You know, all the easy gold deposits have been discovered and subsequently mined. That's probably true, but I don't think we're at peak gold. You know, that the theory of peak oil, which is where peak gold comes from, has been around since the 1970s, and we're producing more barrels of oil today than we, than we ever have. And why is that? Well, uh, technology is certainly a big factor in that. Uh, if you look at the gold industry, the size of the process plants and the Canadian Malartic is a perfect example where in, uh, in May they were processing 65,000 tons per day. 
in the 1980s, that was unheard of for any gold mine to be produced. They was doing 700,000 tons, 2,000 tons. So that these mines are just getting bigger, which is driving down the grade that can be mined profitably. As the price of gold goes up, you're talking about projects that haven't been built. I would also add, look at all the marginal ounces at existing mines. All of a sudden, you can now mine at a profit. Uh, those all of a sudden go into the mine plan. And I think one of the biggest factors that gets overlooked is China. China is the number one gold producer in the world and not one major gold company is operating there. So what does that tell you about the untapped potential in, in that country? So I, I don't think we're anywhere near peak gold. I'm not saying we're going to go drastically higher, but I don't see us falling off a cliff. That makes a lot of sense, and I, I'm with you there. Um, what do you think is like, going to be the outlook for the industry like next couple of months? Do you expect a massive M&A boom, or everybody's praying for it, and I don't see the reasons for it just, just yet? I don't maybe we need one big catalyst or something. I don't see 2000 gold as the catalyst. Um, what's your opinion on that? Well, I, I do think for the time being, you're hearing all the right comments coming out of the management teams. They're going to be disciplined. Uh, they're not going to be overpaying for, for mergers. And I think that's the right frame of mind. Generally, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of M&A activity. If you look at the history of the gold sector, what has M&A made sense? When, uh, when we were at Gold Corp and we bought Wheaton River, there was a re-rating that occurred there and the stock went from $15 a share to $45 a share. So if you can get a re-rating for whatever reason, look at M&A. If there's operating synergies, you know, Barrick and Newmont in Nevada, you should look at M&A. Or if uh, one operating team can bring in a, a skill set to an existing asset or financial, then it should be looked at. But beyond that, um, I haven't seen a lot of why M&A should be done because there's usually not a lot of synergy other than reducing the head office staff. Uh, but beyond that, you know, when you look at Rangold and the Barrick merger or you look at Equinox uh, earlier this year, you know, the whole idea of zero premium mergers and equals, I think, makes, makes sense. Uh, you know, generally, when you pay 30, 40 percent premiums in a merger type situation, you're overpaying. The market's usually more intelligent than what people give it credit for. Um, so I have to applaud people who are not looking after, who are not looking out for their jobs. They're looking out for the shareholders, uh, and usually that happens when the management team has a big shareholding. No, that makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate your insights there, Ian. We, we've hit our time limit. Um, really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for taking the time. Everybody else, thanks for watching. This was uh, episode 65 of SF Live. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the CEO of the Soul Financial Group. We were joined by Ian Ball, President and CEO of IBTB Royalties, Inc. Make sure to follow the company on Twitter. They have five followers. Make sure to increase that. But also uh, make sure to follow us here. Sign up for our YouTube channel. Follow us on Instagram and Spotify as well. Uh, now that everybody seems to be commuting, at least here on the West Coast, more to work, uh, make sure to listen to our Spotify podcast as well. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll talk again very soon. Thanks, Ian. Thank you.